Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Banks. I'm director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU. And it is my pleasure to, wel to welcome you all here this evening. Um, a beautiful spring evening like this one in New York should be about as tantalizing a distraction from the panel discussion as I can imagine. So I'm especially glad to see such a nice turnout. It really speaks to how significant this topic is to so many of us. The name of tonight's panel is Distracted, Attention in the Digital Age, which was a convenient way uh, for us to uh, work in as many ideas as we will be addressing this evening. Um, as we came to talk about the possibility of dedicating a panel to considering the great interest in reframing our understanding of distraction, however, I considered a few alternatives. Uh, I have to admit I toyed with the idea briefly of the hokey uh, but always effective solution of appropriating a Carver-esque twist and titling the panel, What We Talk About When We Talk About Distraction. Uh, which would, in a very quick way, bring to the fore the fact that for all our panelists, the notion of distraction offers a way to think about a host of related but somewhat different um, uh, concepts that can uh, help us to understand what it is me we mean when we talk about distraction. If we had chosen this title, we might be forced to immediately stop and take apart what is most critical in our discussions of distraction and its effects on how we live our lives. It would raise the question uh, why, so many, why so many writers and thinkers have returned for the past several years to our need for attention, indeed our need to pay special attention to the demands of attention, and to question why distraction, why now? Would the crucial component be something like the impact of digital technologies after, say, the mid-1990s, when the new media of communications began to register more and more deeply in the ways we interact and have interacted as social beings, and the radically novel impositions on our control over the organization of concentration and attention first became apparent. Or maybe the mid-2000s, when the rise of social media amplified the disruption of the attention economy that had begun with the rise of the internet. Or on the other hand, when we talk about distraction, is the focus on the keyboard and the screen a red herring? And what we're really talking about is a distant aftershock of the seismic shift that was first felt with the advent of modernity. Does it dovetail with other social and political dislocations that have been underway for far longer? After all, it was more than two centuries ago that Wordsworth penned his concern, which sounds so eerily contemporary despite the language, about those, quote, men in cities where the uniformity of their occupations produces a craving for extraordinary incident, which the rapid communication of intelligence hourly gratifies. If we, reg if we recognize what an immediate concern distraction presents to us in the 21st century, the contributions of the panel tonight may also give us a sense of how, what we have thought about the problem of tension and the sensibility in prior times how that might inform our discussion today and what makes it particularly pertinent to the way we live now. At least a title like what we talk about when we talk about distraction would have the benefit of underlining the fact that addressing the notion of distraction requires careful and thoughtful unpacking, whether on the psychological and neurobiological level of how attention and distraction work in our brains or in terms of the politics and even aesthetics of distraction. Our panelists tonight will speak of distraction and a host of other shadow ideas with which it is concerned, from attention to absorption and from numerous points of entry. I have felt invigorated by their various perspectives and I'm glad to have them all join us tonight. There is a tendency to feel ourselves wearied and overwhelmed by the distractions we face in our everyday life. In the four quartets, Eliot was filled with ponderous bleakness at being, quote, distracted from distraction by distraction, characterizing it as, quote, filled with fancies and empty of meaning, tumid apathy with no concentration, men and bits of paper whirled by the cold wind. Our discussion need not be quite so dire this evening. Indeed, I hope it's not. Um, I'm, I'm at least optimistically inclined to note that our panel will help us to consider a different and, I hope, uh, somewhat more hopeful way to think and to talk about distraction and reconsider what attention might mean to us. We're especially fortunate to welcome here tonight our moderator, Virginia Heffernan, who has written astutely about the perils and promises of paying attention in the digital age. Heffernan is a features writer for the New York Times Magazine and the editorial director of West, a creative capital outfit based in San Francisco. Her book, Ma uh, Magic and Loss, The Pleasures of the Internet, will be published early next year by Simon & Schuster. In addition to serving as one of our most perspicacious uh, cultural critics and commentators, Heffernan holds a PhD in English from Harvard and is a visiting scholar at NYU. You will have to pre-order Heffernan's book on Amazon, but books by our other participants will be available for sale um, at the back of the room at the conclusion of our event. We'll also take your comments and questions and uh, observations at the mics here to the side when we, when we finish our discussion. And as odd as it may seem to say this at an event about distraction, uh, I'd like to remind you to check and turn off your cell phones, um, or at least to shut off the ringer. Now it is my pleasure to turn the stage over to Virginia Heffernan. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming tonight, consenting to sit in a room with, uh, with blinds closed. Um, Is this the microphone? Yeah. 
Um, it's a little bit of a cliche, but we have a great lineup tonight. On the base, Matthew Crawford is a senior fellow at the University of Virginia's Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture and a fabricator of components for custom motorcycles. His best-selling book, Shop Class as Soulcraft, an inquiry into the value of work, translated into nine languages, has prompted a wide rethinking of education and labor policies in the United States and Europe, leading the London, London Sunday Times to call him one of the most influential thinkers of our time. His new book, The World Beyond Your Head, on becoming an individual in an age of distraction, was released in April by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Mark Edmondson is, above all, my former college thesis advisor. Um, and as a sideline, he's a university <laughs> professor at the University of Virginia, um, where he's taught for 30 years. Um, he's the author of 10 books, including Literature Against Philosophy, Plato to Derrida, Why Read, and Why Teach in Defense of a Real Education. His new book, Self and Soul, A Defense of Ideals, will be out this fall from Harvard. In recognition of his teaching, he was awarded the NEH Distinguished Teaching Professorship, and I can testify he's a brilliant teacher. Winifred Gallagher is a journalist who investigates questions about human behavior. Why are we the way we are, and why do we do the things we do? She's written for many publications, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, and Rolling Stone. Her books include New, Understanding Our Need for Novelty and Change, Wrapped, Attention and the Focused Life, a New York Times bestseller, House Thinking, Just the Way You Are, a New York Times notable book, and The Power of Place. David, and I realized I don't have exactly your last name. David Mickix. Mickix um, is the author of Slow Reading. Mickix is OK, too. <laughs> Mickix, yeah, I thought there might be a, yes. Um, is the author of Slow Reading in a Hurried Age. His other recent books are the annotated Emerson, and with Stephen Burt, The Art of the Sonnet, both from Harvard. His book, Bellows People, will be published by Norton in 2016. Mickix is a columnist on Jewish subjects for Tablet Magazine and a fellow of the New York Institute for the Humanities here at NYU. He lives in Brooklyn and Houston, where he's the John and Rebecca Moores Professor in the Honors College and the English Department at the University of Houston. So that's our group tonight. The way we're going to proceed is, um, is very formally and it will demand a lot of focus and concentration on your parts. Um, each of the panelists is going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes. There will be nothing free and easy about it. And then we will um, turn to a Q&A and maybe some, um, some uh, interchange among the panelists. Um, so without any more yammering, I give you Matthew Crawford. I thought I was going last. I give you <laughs> David Mickix. Turn the mic to the mic. The mic can't hear you. Sorry? You're going first. I'm going first? You no, Winifred's going first. <laughs> Who's going first? Who's on first? Who's on first? I thought I was supposed to go first, but I don't know. No, that's right. You were supposed to go yeah, first. That's, right. that's what we decided. <laughs> so, so Winifred Gallagher, take it away. No one paid we attention. <laughs> yeah, we didn't. We ignored the call. I'm sure it will if it's on. Is it on? Yeah, can you can hear me? I'm sorry I can't look at you all over there too much because of these blinding lights that are shining us. Um, I'd like to talk about distraction by talking about attention because distraction is really anti-attention. Um, attention is spotlighting a compelling stimulus whether it's a stop sign or a stab of jealousy, and suppressing competing stimuli. It's the key to controlling your experience and changing your life. As William James put it, my experience is what I agree to attend to. My experience is what I agree to attend to. The idea that your life is the sum of the material objects and mental subjects that you focus on is not some fanciful notion, but a physiological fact. Let's do a little experiment. Focus, just focus on my hand for a couple of seconds. Neuroscientists have discovered what just went on in your brain when you looked at my hand. 
they found that attention is a process of selection in which your brain highlights or photographs a compelling sight or sound. It was compelling just because I asked you to look at it. In your internal or external world and suppresses the rest. If you were looking at my hand, if, if a clown came walking down the side of the room and quietly, quietly took a seat in the first row, chances are very good that you would not have noticed. There have actually been fascinating experiments to that effect. So when you're paying attention, you're not just focusing on one thing, you're suppressing everything else. It's selective. Attention's great benefit is turning the vast world into your smaller world but it has a drawback. That little piece of reality that you zero in on is far more fragmented and subjective than you might assume. If you look back over your years, you'll see that if you had paid attention to other things, your reality, your life, and yourself could be quite different. The same dynamic applies to the future that you create. As the expression pay attention suggests, you have a limited supply of this mental money to spend over your lifetime. How will you choose to invest it? Your answers help shape your brain, your world, and your experience. To ensure our survival, Homo sapiens evolved two ways of focusing. Involuntary, bottom-up attention asks, what's the obvious thing to zero in on here, right now, me talking. Could it be a wailing siren or flashing red lights? Any, any stimulus of that nature that demands that you pay attention to it. But voluntary, top-down attention asks, what do I want to concentrate on? Do I want to concentrate on the racket on the street or the work I'm trying to do? The jealous thought or the peaceful thought? Top-down attention lets you choose what you focus on and thereby choose your experience. So a distraction is simply a stimulus that interferes with your deployment of top-down attention. As soon as you pay attention to the distraction, you're, you're trying to work, but suddenly you see a pop-up for a catalog sale at L.L. Bean on your screen and you start paying attention to L.L. Bean, it's not a distraction anymore because you have allowed that stimulus to capture your attention. During the serious illness that led me to research and write Wrapped, I saw that the power to focus on one thought rather than another is especially crucial when dealing with the negative stuff in life, whether it's events, ideas, emotions. We naturally pay more attention to fear and sadness than to pleasant feelings because they cause pain, which motivates us to solve the underlying cause. When you're upset by a quarrel, it moves you to make amends. If you're angered by injustice, you protest. In those cases, focusing on something negative is useful. Often, however, we end up stuck on painful or destructive thoughts and feelings that serve no problem-solving purpose. You know the sort. I'll never lose those five pounds. So-and-so gets all the lucky breaks. To protect your experience, you've got to focus away from these useless thoughts to more productive and positive ideas. I'll lose the weight if I go to the gym. People who work hard make their own breaks. They're not just more pleasant, they're more practical because they literally expand your world. Research has shown that your visual field actually broadens to enable you to see the big picture and consider more options if you've been primed by something positive to think about. In contrast, negative feelings literally shrink your visual and conceptual reality, which contracts to whatever makes you feel bad. We've all experienced that. When something bad happens, it seems like it's the only thing that's ever happened to you. Research on neuroplasticity shows that your brain and behavior can be changed by what you attend to and experience. One example, navigating London's maze of streets enlarges a taxi driver's hippocampus, 
which is a part of the brain that's involved in spatial processing and memory. It actually grows as hippocampus. Similarly, attentional workouts, most of which are derived from meditation, not necessarily in any way religious, can modify your brain and make you more focused, engaged, and perhaps even kinder. There are two basic types. Single pointed attention to a target, the familiar thing of paying attention to your breath, which is shown to improve your ability to concentrate in daily life. And research, uh, a lot of it conducted with Buddhist monks, suggests that meditating on compassion can actually also increase your capacity for, for fellow feeling. An attentional practice can even fine tune your temperament, which is your personality's biological foundation. Some of us are born with an upbeat disposition, and that correlates with greater activation in certain left prefrontal brain regions. But other people can acquire the same activation and positive focus through attentional training. The point is not to try to feel happy all the time, which would be futile and grotesque, but to focus on what makes you feel and function well. Even during a health or a financial crisis, good and beautiful things can be happening too. The joy and meaning you find in life and your current stressor are two separate issues and you, could tend, you can attend appropriately to both. As Shu Jiao Rinpoche, a Tibetan Lama and a University of Wisconsin meditation research subject says, whether in meditation or daily life, we try to pay attention to just being present rather than being caught between hope and fear, which is the mind's usual condition. In daily life, rapt attention, whether to work, relationships, or recreation, makes the difference between passing the time and time well spent. Focus is essential to the, pre, to the peak experience or flow state that kicks in when you concentrate on challenging but enjoyable activities. The, the best recipe for human happiness that I've ever encountered is, is called just manageable difficulty. People are happiest, they're in flow or in peak experience when they have a task that is almost perfectly matched to their abilities. So it's, it's, if it's too hard, it becomes stressful. If it's too easy, it's boring. So you want that, that line of just manageable difficulty when you have to pay attention. Wrapped attention is crucial to creativity, as our little experiments with my hand suggest, and it was actually devised by William James. Focusing on something, whether it's a tune or a face or a conversation, makes it more interesting and engaging. As James says, that's what the genius does in whose hands a given topic coruscates and grows. Attention is as important to love as to work. It's the bottom line in any relationship. But the way attention works means that that little slice of life that you zero in on is far more fragmented and subjective than you think. And that's why when spouses list the past week's events, dinners, fights, sex, problems with a child, whatever, the percentage of a pair's agreement is at the level of mere chance. I love that. The That's level of mere chance. <laughs> Thanks to attention's me mechanics, the common expression, you live in a different world, which we sometimes say in we're vexed, is the simple truth, which is one reason why communication is vital in relationships. Everyone has occasional attention problems, some of which are, norm, are normal. Um, some useful things to bear in mind are these. All, wa all minds wander, perhaps 20% of the time. Merely by focusing on something, a new car, losing a job, whatever, good or bad, we exaggerate its importance. And no matter how great or terrible it is, we'll soon get used to it. We focus on our thoughts about experience, our thoughts about experience, vacationing in a new place is good, rather than the experience itself. I really enjoy going to the same old beach place. We forget that you really must pay attention to that person's name or your new PIN number to learn and remember it. If you do not pay attention, you cannot learn and you will not remember. When you need to focus, 
avoid interruptions because rebooting your brain takes 20 minutes. Work for 90 minutes, then do something else. If your attention fades, have some coffee, walk around, then re refocus on your target and try to notice some new things about it. In our age of cell phones and websites, it's important to understand that multitasking is a myth. When you try to focus on two things at once, phoning while checking your email, you're simply switching rapidly between them, which let, makes you less efficient and more error prone. I gave a talk at uh, Microsoft a while ago and the uh, people came, they could watch in their offices, but a lot of them came to an auditorium and a lot of the people who came to the auditorium brought their laptops. And the chief of research made them fill out a questionnaire asking them some really very basic discussions, uh, questions about my talk on the way out and then they had to submit them. And the people who were on the laptop got like D's and F's. They thought they were there, but they really weren't there. Your electronics are your servants, not your masters. Don't let them choose your focus. <coughs> Regarding more serious attention problems, scientists still don't understand exactly what ADHD is, what causes it, or how to test for it objectively. The decision to medicate a child, especially, is fraught, but the brain of a child who's not attending to important activities in school is not being remodeled by experience, as that brain should be, too. Problematic attention patterns obtain across the spectrum of mental disorders. Depressed people focus on the negative things that make them feel hopeless and helpless. The anxious zero in on threats, hypochondriacs on symptoms. Cognitive behavioral therapy addresses these skewed attention patterns, just simply tries to get people to realize they'll feel better if they pay attention to different things. Since writing Wrapped, I've learned that taking charge of your attention helps you to control your experience, increases your concentration, expands your boundaries, and lifts your spirits. Most important, Wrapped experience being completely absorbed, whether it's in a sunset or a song, project or a person, simply makes life worth living. You cannot be always be happy, but you can almost always be focused, which is as close as we can get. Thank you. Is this one working? Good. Is our current disease too much distraction or too much attention? It can be hard to decide. Take the instance, sadly familiar to most of us, of the nightmare internet session. Where did those two hours just go? Some of it must have been butterflying from one random page to another. That's distraction. But some of it was surely the result of too much attention, of the monomaniacal kind monomaniacal kind, pursuing every last variant of, for instance, a reasonably priced espresso machine, <laughs> and weighing obsessively the likely flaws and virtues of each one, as reported by that hydra-headed beast, the consumer reviews. This is an example from my own life, by the way. In, in the end, no espresso machine was purchased. <laughs> We tend to think of distraction as the devouring monster, the specter of wasted hours, time frittered away. But attention of the obsessive kind that the net seems to encourage is just as much a culprit for the theft of those two hours that will never return. <coughs> we like to picture attention as good. It means productive, satisfying, focused work, and distraction as bad. But is it really so? Of course, it's possible to flip the terms, distraction good, attention bad. Here I want to introduce a passage I read almost exactly 40 years ago. I was about 14 at the time, uh, in which distraction is shown to be spiritually superior to attention. Um, it, this appealed to me tremendously at the time, but I'm more dubious about it now. And uh, it's from a book by Walker Percy called The Moviegoer. This is also pretty much all I remember from the book. Uh, but I remembered it very distinctly, and sure enough, when I Googled it, it was still there. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the um, character, the hero of the novel, was a sort of um, drifter, slacker, daydreamer, 
um, is, I, if I remember correctly, is in college. And he and his partner, Harry, are running an experiment in a lab, in a chemistry lab, on pH levels in pig blood. And then uh, the narrator uh, named Binks Bowling uh, uh, says this, a peculiar thing happened. I became extraordinarily affected by the summer afternoons in the laboratory. The August sunlight lay in yellow bars throughout the room. For minutes at a stretch, I sat on the floor and watched the motes rise and fall in the sunlight. I called Harry's attention to the presence, but he shrugged and went on with his work. He was actually like one of those scientists in the movies who don't care about anything but the problem in their heads. Now here is a fellow who does have a flair for research and will be heard from. But he's no more aware of the mystery which surrounds him than a fish is aware of the water it swims in. Who could be more boring than industrious Harry with his piddly results? By contrast, we have the first person narrator, uh, daydreaming, distractible. He is a distinctive person, a person of imagination. Of course, you can see why the paragraph from Walker Percy uh, appealed for me so powerfully at age 14. It seemed to suggest that by idly staring into space during chem lab, I could become the slacker hero of an autobiographical novel. <laughs> I was, perhaps needless to say, terrible at chemistry. But um, the, the, the thing is kind of a fake, or at least misleading. Percy's hero, Binks Bowling, could never have written The Movie Goer. Writers daydream, but then they work on their daydreams. They follow them up. And scientists are, are not actually like Harry. They are not afflicted with tunnel vision. A good scientist might even be investigating those dust motes. So rather than simply claiming that distraction could be good and creative, or that attention uh, could be dull-minded in the way that Walker Percy's narrator does, I want to turn to two figures from cultural history one highly distractible and the other highly attentive, and show how both of these figures are atonic these days. That is something to think about and admire. Uh, the distractible one is the flaneur. The attentive one is the Holmesian detective, that is the Sherlock Holmesian detective. The flaneur, for example, in the works of uh, Charles Baudelaire, as, as described by Walter Benjamin. The flaneur is the stroller, the idler, wandering and wandering his way through the streets of Paris, drinking in little events, small spectacles, the little things of the city that become rich with significance. That's the distractible character. The attentive character, by contrast, is the Holmesian detective, and it might strike you that nothing could be more opposed than these two. There's a passage, um, I think it's in a study in Scarlet, I'm not sure, where uh, Holmes talks about the mind as, a, as an attic. And he says that uh, you cannot just stuff any old thing into this attic. That's why he, for example, doesn't even know that the earth revolves around the sun. <laughs> he knows nothing about the most basic matters if they're irrelevant to his love, that is detection. Um, if the mind is an attic, Holmes says, uh, each thing in it should be carefully chosen and ready to hand. A workman's tools, nothing more. The detective needs solitude, along with his pipes of tobacco, his cocaine, both <laughs> signs of obsessive intellection. <laughs> he needs to take his time, and uh, this is the respect that I, I, I would want to uh, uh, with which I want to ally him to the flaneur, who also takes his time or her time. Both of these characters have a distinctive rhythm, a personal rhythm, an intimate rhythm. Instead of letting time master them or compel them, they do the mastering. And this, I think, or something like this, is what's missing on the internet as it's currently used. This is a point that's been made, uh, I think, very convincingly by uh, Jaron Lanier, the, uh, the computer scientist and writer. Uh, the, net, the net seems to impose a rhythm on us, and it's not an expressive rhythm. It's not an expressive rhythm. Clicking on links is, for example, the rhythm of day trading or of gambling. 
It offers the illusion of mastery or of control. This is something that Matt has written about recently. But it doesn't offer actual mastery. It offers no possibility for the creative. What we need, and what Jaron Lanier suggests we need in his, um, in his writing on the subject, is, um, is something more personal, something uh, which we can use to express ourselves. Uh, just as you cannot be a flaneur from the window of a speeding car, so you cannot stroll through the internet. Instead, the web is a place to get things done. And all too often, it seems to be, um, it seem, it seems to be controlling us. It seems to be rigidly or strictly um, engineering us rather than the reverse. So I think what we need to aim for, sorry, I'm just checking the time. I'm about to, to wrap up, but I, I want to just um, um, make a brief comment about uh, the general tenor of discussion. It's, um, it, it's easy to sort of fall into the mode that I think of, of uh, ki as uh, kids nowadays. In other words, um, yes, our, um, our experience, our existence has been somehow tampered with, with damaged, even ruined by, uh, by the current technology. I don't think that's true. Um, but I, I do think that a, a, major, a major revision, a major reworking of things in our head, and perhaps also within technology itself, is, is necessary. Uh, it would be silly to say that the internet uh, makes us uh, mechanical, addictive, um, mere pawns, and so on. Um, but on the other hand, it certainly has a role to play. And so uh, what I hope we can do, I hope this conversation helps, is to somehow point the way forward to a, a way that we might think more creatively and more personally about the possibilities of technology now. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, you're next. Thank you. Is, uh, can you hear me OK? Microphone in the right place? <clears throat> Great. OK, so uh, this is uh, called Where Did Attention Go? It is a little on the oblique side, approaches indirectly, but it's all true. Or it's not all true, at least it's pretty short. So. Um, once upon a time, or a time rather long ago, I found myself teaching a course with a renowned philosopher who might better be described as an anti-philosopher, I suppose, Richard Rorty. Rorty was given to quick and cutting diagnoses of one thing and another. Some might call the technique reduction. I was more inclined to think of it as intensification. This particular piece of intensification came in the service or at the expense of one Jacques Derrida. Try thinking of Derrida, Rody said, using a favorite formulation of his, as offering a polemic against closure. A polemic against closure, what exactly did that mean? Derrida was prone to think that writing was so important because it illustrated a common condition of experience. It went on and on. The writing at hand refers to other writing, writing of the past, and writing to come. It spreads out metonymically in every direction, picking up ever more associations, gathering various significations which never resolve themselves into finite and specific meaning because there are always more significations out there to connect with. And naturally, those significations branch out interminably in their turn. Derrida and his followers liked things that were interminable. They smiled when they heard Freud say that in truth, psychoanalysis was never over. There were always new dreams, new slips of the tongue, new slides of the pen, new neuroses, new lurches at health that never, of course, hit the mark. There was also something else to interpret. You could never gather a text into one round ball and say with satisfaction, even exhausted satisfaction, this is what it is. This is what it means. And of course, it had to be true, we all knew as much, that Derrida was talking about more than texts. There is nothing outside the text, his most famous utterance, I suppose, suggested that the very best metaphor for almost any significant form of experience was indeed textual. Events referred to other events in history and through time. Your car referred to other cars and could not be understood in isolation because there had been so many cars and would be so many more, the labor of connect the cars would never end. The argument that you had with your spouse before you came to the talk tonight, she was right, she might have stayed home and paid attention to something else, refers to other such fights, yours and your parents and their parents and so on back to Adam and Eve. Did Adam and Eve have the first marital spat? Derrida would have found a way to demonstrate that this was not so. <laughs> I'm not sure how. I'm not sure now anyone around here could do this either. This is maybe why I miss him so much. 
Derrida's non-affirming affirmation of the text resonated with Dumas' affection for allegory over the symbol, Lacan's sense of desire as metonymic, and Foucault's version of power as a force within an existence that was everywhere with a center that was nowhere. Rorty, who got this discussion started, told me boldly once they didn't care about all that metonymy going on all over the place. He liked the dialectic, he said, the play of finite boundaries, and that was that. He said it, though he did say it in a sort of secret agent whisper voice. I used to think, the point is coming, I used to think people like Derrida and Demand were inaugurating something. They were leading us away from past errors into future truths or anti-truths. But now I'm more inclined to think that they were reflecting something much more than they were initiating it. What were they reflecting? They were, I think, reflecting an age when people's minds wouldn't stay still. They were reflecting a time when the movement of the intelligence was unstillable. I think Derrida and the rest were trying to make a virtue out of a certain kind of necessity. People couldn't find focus, totality, wholeness, what have you. So why not champion the opposite? Mm -hmm. Why not affirm the free play of difference or the movement of the signifier or whatever you happen to favor as a term? If I'm right, and this is only a hypothesis to be sure, <laughs> what made people disposed to think in a centrifugal manner? Though to be sure it was a centrifugalism without a center, centers being quite forbidden by Derrida and his followers, it's very hard to summarize for those reasons. <laughs> now it would be handy to say that Derrida was responding to the age of the computer and the video game and all the rest. He might be seen as trying to understand it in a manner except what we now call attention deficit disorder. The problem is the computers weren't much of anything culturally. On the day in 1966 that Derrida arrived at Johns Hopkins and gave his paper on structure, sign, and play in the discourse of the human sciences. I, for what it's worth, was 14 years old at the time. But if what I'm saying is so, and the metonymy crowd was trying to make a virtue of necessity, they're trying to make that virtue of necessity that predated computers and what we call the culture of distraction and the culture of ADD. They were, I dare say, reflecting and helping to confirm a culture in which people could not focus their minds because they could not find anything worthwhile to focus them upon. What does it mean to focus your mind? What does it mean, perhaps this is a better way to say it, to focus your being? Well, if you're a student of Freud, as Derrida, in fact, was, part of what focusing your being means is somehow overcoming the disjunctions of the psyche. It's no news. From the vantage of Freud, human beings are not whole. We are internally split into two parts. No, in 1914, he disclosed to us that we were cut into three. Ego, superego, and it. It hurts to be cut in three, especially when each of the parts wants something different, which Freud, of course, affirms they do. How do you overcome fragmentation? How do you staunch the pain of being three and not one? Well, you get drunk, says Freud. That glues things together, if only for a while. You feel whole. That drunkenness, that's drunkenness in Freud, making the three parts of the psyche stick together temporarily and get along with each other. You get drunk or you fabricate inebriation. There are other ways to solve the disjunction that Freud confirms and that Derrida tries to make the best of. For Freud, the disjunction is a form of pain, but you have to live with it or get drunk. To Derrida, disjunction can be greatly pleasurable once you get the hang of it. He calls it play, jouissance. But there are many forms of inebriation in life, some alcoholic, some not. Love is inebriation, if you ask Freud. So is creation, and sometimes even the perception of art. Religion is surely a form of inebriation for the analyst, for the analyst as are most collective movements, especially if they have a leader attached to them. One indulges in these illusions at a cost. One is deceived or self-deceived by God, by leader or by love, and then faces the consequences. The hangover from fair love, this is Freud, the hangover from fair love is not sweet, nor from religious disillusionment, nor from political failure of a certain dramatic sort. The morning after of Germany, from about a dozen years of mid-century inebriation, lasts, I believe, to this day. Stay sober, says Freud. Accept fragmentation. Accept a being that is always fractured, wayward, unfocused, except anxiety. Revel in fragmentation, says Derrida. Use it to stimulate motion, variety, difference, and play. Derrida takes off from Freud. 
He tries to help us live in a land where fragmentation is the name of the game. This fragmentation does not owe to video games or cell phones or too much flat screen TV. Rather, it owes to a world in which those forces and entities that have unified human beings now seem able to do so no more. Read that again, Scott. It owes to a world in which those forces and entities that have unified human beings now seem able to do so no more. If you have no faith in religion or art or politics or love, you will live, presumably, in a world of fragmentation. You won't have anything that you can trust to focus your whole being. You will not have any legitimate access to the unification of the self unless you think of getting drunk as a legitimate way to solve your existential dilemmas. You will encourage and fund the culture that allows you to participate in an outer life that is as turbulent as your inner life. You will seek for and find the kind of corroboration of your own inner dispersal that Derrida tried not to find, but to create through his ingenious and more than ingenious interpretive exertions. Our culture of distraction, it is not a culture that has risen up to overthrow ideals. It is, I think, a culture that reflects a human state in which the ideals, love, compassion, courage, the pursuit of truth, have already been overthrown. As long as there's nothing worth focusing on in our culture and in our souls, we will continue to live in a world of distraction. Allowing one's attention to run amok is perhaps a way of reacting to a crisis of ethics and meaning. Resolve that crisis in a plausible way, and many of our epiphenomenal concerns about distraction and displacement and the rule of the random will probably decease, recede. Perhaps they will even melt away. But that is easier by far to talk about than to do. Thank you. Wow. Well, <clears throat> I really um, love David's point about the uh, shopping for an espresso machine as sort of the paradigmatic use of the web that totally fits my experience. And you're right, it's a kind of going down a rabbit hole more than being distracted. And I love um, Mark's bit about uh, sort of POMO centrifugality, making a, a virtue and also a theoretical fetish of a sociological fact. Um, that's great. Um, so so um, I'm going to be sort of speaking out of this book I wrote that's about attention as a cultural problem. Um, and it's very synthetic. It draws in lots of different kinds of um, literatures. But uh, for my 10 minutes, I'm going to zero in on something very narrow, and it's going to be um, kind of political. So. Um, I was in a supermarket uh, a few years ago, and I swiped my bank card to pay for my groceries. And you've got the little screen that you watch intently, waiting for it to prompt you to do the next steps. And so in those intervals between swiping my card and um, entering my PIN and confirming the amount, I was shown advertisements on the little screen. Because some genius had figured out that a person in that situation is a captive audience. And the intervals themselves, I previously assumed, were just an artifact of the communication technology. But now, it kind of felt like they were something more deliberately calibrated, because these haltings now serve somebody's interest. And um, there was a moment when, uh, you know, I guess I had a gestalt shift. I started to see things like that everywhere. It does seem like a new frontier of capitalism has been opened up by our self-appointed disruptors. Uh, speaking of which, just yesterday, I spoke at Google. Um, and uh, in, on this new frontier, you win competitive advantage by being the most aggressive in digging up and monetizing every bit of private headspace. Um, now, of course, we've developed habits for trying to tune out this stuff. You can um, you know, bury your face in your own device or whatever it may be. But if you ride the bus in uh, South Korea, you actually have uh, it squirted into your nose. So th there's a smell resembling that of Dunkin' Donuts coffee that is released into the ventilation system of the bus 
as the Dunkin' Donuts jingle plays over the sound system. And this happens just before the bus pulls up outside a Dunkin' Donuts. And the driver points out the fact, in case you somehow missed it. Mm. There remain many areas for uh, further progress. Um, the, uh, so all the little, uh, I promise this won't simply be a list of complaints, but let me just add a few more to sort of fill out the picture here. Um, so the, all the little like permission slips and report cards that a teacher sends home with students are in many school districts still blank on the back. So here's a gross offense against the efficient use of space. But there's one, at least one forward-thinking school district in Massachusetts that now sells ads space on the backs of these slips of paper. So um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, and by the way, I learned that from the Colbert Report. And, and it almost seems like you have to be a comedian to wrap your head around certain developments in contemporary culture. I'm making my way through O'Hare Airport and um, not feeling especially receptive to the uh, message that's on the handrail of the escalator. So on the moving handrail, in an endlessly recurring loop, it says, you're in charge. <laughs> I'm not feeling especially in charge. Uh, I get to my gate, um, you know, with an hour to kill, and I can't escape the chattering of CNN. Um, if the TV is within view, I find it very hard not to look at it. Um, the introduction of novelty into your field of view commands what the cognitive psychologists call an orienting response. And it's an important, uh, so what happens is an animal turns its face and eyes to the new thing, whatever it may be, which is an important adaptation uh, in a world of predators, right? Because it could be a python. Well, a new thing it, it typically appears about once every second on TV. Um, the images on the screen jump out of the flow and make uh, a demand on us. In their presence, it's hard to rehearse a remembered conversation, for example. Now, alternatively, people in that kind of situation will stare at their phones or open a novel, hoping to tune out the piped-in chatter. But in this battle of attentional technologies, what's lost, I think, is the kind of public space that's required for a certain kind of sociability. A public space where people are not self-enclosed in the heightened way that happens when our minds are elsewhere than our bodies may feel um, rich with possibility for spontaneous encounters. Even if we don't converse with others, our mutual reticence is experienced as reticence if our attention is not otherwise bound up, but is rather free to alight upon one another and linger or not, because we ourselves are free to pay out our attention in deliberate measures. And I think that to be the object of someone's reticence is quite different from not being seen by them. We might have a, a vivid experience of having encountered another person, even um, if in silence. And those kind of encounters are always ambiguous. And their need for interpretation gives rise to a train of imaginings that are often erotic. I think that's what makes cities exciting, Washington Square Park. Now, of course, um, in that airport scene, you can simply shift in your seat and avert your gaze from the screens. But the fields of view that haven't been claimed for commerce seem to be getting fewer and narrower. The ever more complete penetration of public spaces by attention-getting technologies, which may be very low-tech, nothing, there's nothing inherently digital about turning unavoidable public surfaces into sites of marketing. But in any case, this exploits the orienting response in a way that preempts sociability, directing us away from one another and toward a manufactured reality, the content of which is determined from afar by private parties that have a material interest in doing so. Now, in the main currents of psychological research, really for 
for the last hundred years, really, attention is treated as a resource. A person has only so much of it. But we don't yet have a political economy corresponding to this resource. And so um, I think we need uh, the concept of an attentional commons. So there are some resources that we hold in common, such as the air we breathe and the water we drink. We take them for granted, but their widespread availability makes everything else we do possible. I think the absence of noise is a resource of just this sort. More precisely, the valuable thing that we take for granted is the condition of not being addressed. Just as clean air makes it possible to breathe, silence in this broader sense is what makes it possible to think. And that's no small thing. Now we give it up willingly when we're in the company of other people that we know, and when we open ourselves to serendipitous encounters with strangers. To be addressed by mechanized means is an entirely different matter. The benefits of silence are off the books. They're not measured directly by a gross domestic product, but surely contribute to creativity and innovation and things that economists do care about. They don't show up in social statistics, such as level of educational achievement, yet one uh, makes use of, uh, consumes isn't quite the right notion here, but one makes use of a great deal of silence in the course of becoming educated. Um, <clears throat> one of the sort of notable features of the gangster-like regimes in many formerly communist countries is the apparent absence or impotence of any notion of a common good. Um, so self-serving party apparatchiks were replaced by or simply became uh, quasi-free market gangsters. And um, many of the people who live in those countries now um, find themselves living in the environmental degradation that happens when uh, economic development is left to such interests with no countervailing force of public spiritedness. And so I wonder if we in the liberal societies of the West are headed toward a similar condition with respect to the resource of attention because we don't yet um, think of it as a resource. Or do we? Um, silence is now offered as a luxury good. So in the business class lounge at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, what you hear is the occasional tinkling of a spoon against China. It's lovely. Uh, I saw no ads on the walls. Uh, there were no TVs. And this silence, I think, is what makes it feel gen genuinely luxurious. When you walk in and there's these sort of airtight doors that whoosh shut behind you, the difference is nearly tactile. It's like uh, stepping out of hair cloth into satin. Your brow unfurrows itself. Your neck muscles start to relax. And after 20 minutes, you no longer feel exhausted. The hassle lifts. Now, outside the lounge is the usual airport cacophony. Because we've allowed our attention to be monetized, if you want yours back, you're going to have to pay for it. As the commons gets appropriated, one solution for those who have the means is to leave the commons for private clubs, such as the business class lounge. Now, consider that it's those in the business lounge who d make the decisions that determine the character of the peon lounge and you might start to see these things in a political light. To engage in playful, inventive thinking and possibly create wealth for oneself during those idle hours spent at an airport requires silence. But other people's minds over in the peon lounge or the bus can be treated as a resource, a standing reserve of purchasing power to be steered according to um, the innovative and brilliant marketing ideas hatched by those enjoying silence in the business lounge. 
When some people treat the minds of other people as a resource, this is not creating wealth, as one often hears. It's a transfer of wealth. The ever greater concentration of wealth in a shrinking elite is, is, has many complex causes, obviously. Um, but let's just throw one more into the mix for consideration. And that is the ever more aggressive appropriations of the attentional commons that we've allowed to take place. I think this becomes especially pertinent in an era of big data when we find ourselves the object of attention-getting techniques that are not only pervasive, but um, increasingly well-targeted. There's a lot of talk about a right to privacy in our digital lives. I think we need to sharpen the conceptually murky uh, right to privacy by supplementing it with something like a right not to be addressed. And, uh, what shape that would take, uh, I don't know. But this would apply not, of course, to those who address me face to face um, as individuals, but to those who never show their face and treat my mind as a resource to be harvested by mechanized means. Thank you. Well, that was, as I expected, that was wonderfully stimulating, those pa these four papers. But to, to my surprise, it was also very moving. Um, some new to me phonemes, like the, the name Rinpoche, that um, I might have heard that I think is a, a name given maybe an honorific to Tibetan monks. Um, means precious jewel. Means precious jewel, and taken on as a last name. Or no, seemingly it's a, it's a last honorific. name. It's honorific. It's a title. And but that follows, like Chogyam Rinpoche, maybe follows the, in 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 American circles. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that distracted me for a minute. My wondering whether that was honorific and why I'd never bothered to find out. Um, any mention of the moviegoer brings back many of our adolescences. Um, and then um, hearing Mark do an impression of Richard Rorty. Um, <laughs> I sort of got to Rorty um, through Mark um, as an undergraduate and, um, and ended up using his work in my dissertation and then, uh, and then um, to Derrida through Rorty. Um, and so, and both of those philosophers are um, dearly missed. Um, but there is, in a way, no way to talk about Rorty without um, hearing his voice. So anyone who can do a convincing posthumous impression of him is also precious, precious to me. You have a Rorty impression? Just the, the shrug. shrug. The mash. When, he, when yeah. you ask him a question. Yeah. <laughs> the shrug is very important about him, isn't it? The Rorty shrug. Um, the Rorty shrug. Well, I'll do it for you later. Um, and s since everyone mentioned us, uh, uh, st started with a personal moment where these subjects of attention and distraction came home to them, I'll, I'll just share, share mine or one of mine. Um, I was uh, sort of long believed that the, um, the question around attention is a question about literacy and an anxiety about the hyperlexia that is demanded, the excessive reading, reading we can't complete that's demanded of us by the internet. Um, most of the code, uh, all of the code on the internet is, 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 is what they call, what coders call read, read code. So it, you know, what's interesting about the internet is unlike ordinary experience, it can be archived, it can be called up, it can be searched. Um, it's almost impossible to write write-only code, code that just goes in one direction. Um, so my first understanding of the internet is that it's meant to be read, and the second <laughs> understanding is that it's impossible to read all of it. Um, and we've, uh, in some sense, I think, constructed this deficit, this attention deficit disorder in the mirror of an impossible to read text that we're all constantly creating um, with our tweets and our emails and our texts. So anyway, with this frustration that I can never read enough and I can never read it all and that, the, um, that I'm always in the hole, you know, that I start and end every day in the hole, there's always one more review of espresso machines that I could be reading that would seal the case for one or another. Um, I uh, was reading the New York Times online um, and I knew, as we all do, that the, um, that, that, that the internet is, and especially media outlets, are gathering data on us while we read. So like trying to see 
um, not just what we click on, but like how much time we spend on certain places. And as a writer for the Times, I was sometimes treated to the metrics around my stories. How much time had people spent on them? How much had they searched for them? How much had they tweeted them? Um, and uh, initially, we were supposed to be sort of coldly indifferent to that. Um, by the end, we were supposed to cravenly court that attention. <laughs> um, write headlines meant to be optimally circulated on the, on, in search. Write optimized for mobile, which I can, which probably Matthew understands better than I do, having spent some time at Google and so on. Anyway, I was reading the New York Times, the front page, and I found myself doing what I usually do when I read the New York Times, fighting with A.G. Edwards to find the little cross in the corner so I could exit out and read an article about Nepal. This is not reading. This is being read. They, I was this, this kind, you know, I realized this like, what I had thought of as this dignified heroic act reading had been turned into this supremely undignified act of being read. Um, so, um, so that's a sort of founding story for me. The other thing that I'm constantly trying to do because of an accident of internet history. Um, I joined the internet in 1979. Um, it was ARPANET era. They had um, introduced a mainframe to my hometown in Hanover, New Hampshire. And, uh, and in exchange for getting to use this real estate with the mainframe, um, the new president of the college, who'd been Einstein's assistant and, and wrote the language basic, agreed to like very reluctantly to have school children in town come as the kind of like civic gesture to have the school children come to, come in and get like a perfunctory lesson in basic and um, like all computer lectures almost everybody left and was bored except for you know five boys and me and we wanted to do learn basic and um, so I managed to persuade my parents that I, w I would be a great candidate for a NASA astronaut if I could get a uh, dumb terminal and call into the mainframe and learn coding. But also, like everyone who's ever joined the internet, I quickly learned that um, the internet was for social life. And I um, stumbled on a network that allowed me to pretend to be um, much older and have conversations about like Reaganomics. And, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so because that happened to me so early in my life, I was almost 10, I was just 10, I have a hard time remembering life before the internet. So I like hearing stories like from my very f formative years of what reading used to be like. You know, did people really get the critique of pure reason and just sit down and from dawn to dusk read the whole thing with a perfect Cassell's German-English dictionary, looking things up back and forth, never lose attention, their wife brought them a sandwich? That's how I picture it. Um, maybe it wasn't like that. Um, so um, I want to turn it over to you for, turn this over for, to you for, for uh, questions. Um, there's a microphone here. Is there one on this side? No, the, yes. Um, and, uh, and maybe you can share your experiences with distraction and respond to some of these interesting papers. Excellent. Hello there. Um, from, uh, Professor Winter, or Professor Gallagher's talk um, made me think of my practice of Tai Chi. I've been a student of Tai Chi, a practitioner for, for a few months now. And I've found that what it allows me to do is take my limited amount of concentration of attention and direct it very specifically. When I'm practicing, I can direct it on myself and my emotions so that when I'm out of the Tai Chi hypnotic state, I can concentrate more fully on other things. I can let myself drop very deeply into a book, into a movie. Thank you. I was saying that I do a lot of Tai Chi, and when I do that, I can focus my attention better. Um, and I found that what breaks that concentrated state when I'm doing something else, I find myself very fully in a piece of music, whatever. What brings me out is the moment I start considering my relationship to the piece of music, what it means to me, what it's doing to me, and start asking myself, what is, okay, I like this piece of music, what do I do now? What does this mean to me? And so, kind of, the search for identity and a compulsion to find meaning in my, my everyday life is exactly what breaks my concentration and forces me to get distracted. So I wanted to hear, um, one of you maybe talk about the relationship between distraction and the search for identity. Is the search for identity a distraction in itself? Well, it's not an either or 
uh, predicament, is it? Can't you? Can't we do both? Can't we? Can't we participate in the experience and be totally focused, and then think about how that might impact our identity at another time, and give our attention to that activity? I mean, I, I think you're you're absolutely right that uh, there's a lot of research now, and it's not just woo-woo stuff. Uh, a lot of research shows that you can really train your ability to to attend and focus, and that the the half an hour you spend doing that uh, in the morning or wherever is going to change your ability to focus on everyday life activities uh, for the rest of the day. That's that's absolutely the case. But I, I guess I don't quite understand what's what is the problem for you. Um, it's. I mean, I assume it's tied in with, with anxiety issues, kind of a need to make every moment as meaningful as possible, but the very idea of concentrating on the concept of making the me moment as meaningful as possible and trying to force myself to go into it is what makes it difficult to do so. I have to find sort of a relaxation first though, so in order to have the proper kind of attention, focus on the object of my desire itself and not the, my desire for the I object. I think it's called spectatoring. Some psychologists call it spectatoring, so that you end up being a spectator of your experience instead of experiencing your experience, right? Well, I think that goes back to Walker Percy mm -hmm. um, point. Uh, you know, try not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> or it might be possible. I don't know, Mark, if you agree, but it might be possible to enjoy your symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't sound so bad to me. Yeah. Um, and uh, I be, probably because Virginia's here, I'm thinking about Keats. And one of the things you see in his poetry is that he'll write this astonishing headlong poem. And then he'll back off in his letters and do a lot of thinking about poetry and where he is in relationship to other poets and begin to create a certain kind of self-consciousness that immediately is broken down as he enters into the next phase of his development. And this movement from immersion uh, to self-consciousness into immersion, I think real abstracted, I don't know why, uh, is um, uh, uh, part of what makes the accelerated development of this poet possible. You know, he, he moves from immersion to, what did I do just then, to immersion, and he keeps getting better and better all the time, and it's sort of great. I, t I took um, the, the point to be of the, of the, the question or the statement that, um, that maybe there's a kind of premature standing apart from mm -hmm. his own experience that's somehow driven by this imperative to reflect, sort of go meta uh, and reflect on your experience, which does seem like a, it can be a genuine affliction, notwithstanding what you're just saying, there's a kind of iterated process of standing back and a deepening experience can happen through that. But to not be able to throw yourself into it in the first place would seem to short circuit that. Next up. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, so this, okay. Um, I, I came in a little bit late, no, so I, no, I can't hear you. you can't hear me, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, um, so th this uh, question is for Matthew Crawford, but I think the other panelists might be able, be able to address it too, because I came in late, so I didn't hear all the presentations. Um, you, you were speaking of the, um, encounters with other human beings and then encounters or I don't know what you want to call them but um, run-ins with with advertising as two discrete categories of things but I'm thinking that um, what we're seeing maybe what we've always seen since the beginning of advertising or the things that came before it is um, a real merging of those two things um, like there are in really disturbing ways like I can think of lots of examples where I have, um, I'm having an encounter with someone and then uh, I start to realize that I'm being sold something. <laughs> and you know, like many times on the street in, in New York, I'll be walking around and someone will come up to me and smiling and say hello and I'll, I'll think it's someone who needs to ask for directions and then she'll ask me if I want to donate to Planned Parenthood or get my hair cut or, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and I think, and I was just, I was reading an article in The Guardian I can't, I didn't finish the article because I can't, you know, it's, it's hard to do. But, <laughs> um, about how um, recently uh, companies and marketing agencies are finding useful, the, the findings in psychology that um, 
we are not just driven by self-interest, that we're also driven by, by altruism and by friendship and by love. And they're finding that the easiest way to sell something is to tie it into a relationship that you have that is meaningful in other ways with a person. So we have brand ambassadors and you know, the social, the, the marketing aspect of social media. You know, and, and I think that uh, relationships are so bound up with selling things. Maybe they always sort of have been, but they're bound up with selling in a way that I think is accelerating and is becoming disturbing in new ways. So. Yeah. Anything you could say for that? That's the point of Super Bowl advertising, from what I can tell. It's always about the, the adorable little kid or the Budweiser beer horse that loves the little puppy. And, you know, it's, it's, it, they're so emotional, those, that whole phenomenon. And people who don't even like football will just watch because they like to see the ads. Yeah, well, there's that. I mean, there's using the simulacra of people in advertisements, and then there are the encounters with a human being like you right in front of me and then all of a sudden you're selling me you know you're telling me about this great brand that you are connected with and and a lot of that is just i mean buy my book <laughs> exactly right <laughs> so my new friend. i mean yeah. to what extent is that an authentic part of human interaction and to what extent are we kind of doing some harm to each other by well, bringing that i think i think you're onto something i mean if we're <laughs> I mean, the, the Amway person is not someone you really <laughs> form close friendships with, mm -hmm. right? Um, because the, fr the friendship is a means to... But it's still a somehow human encounter, right? To sh sure, I, but um, right, they're, they're, um, there's a rank order mm -hmm. of human encounters. Aristotle taught, has four different kinds of friendship. One of them is uh, friendships based on utility. Um, which would be the Amway friend, uh, where you're, you're a means to some end that isn't internal to the friendship itself, I think. So, so we shouldn't be shy about um, th thinking in terms of rank, uh, and sh sh people have always used one another with, um, you know, with varying levels of uh, you know, sincerity or, or lack thereof. But uh, but you're mentioning um, kind of social media, which is so deeply woven into our lives, becoming uh, an, in an instrument of um, sort of monetizing or instrumentalizing relationships. And that, that has to be flagged as something very uh, significant, I think. So thank you. An another way to put it is that the world that Matt is so eloquently describing is going to create a lot of loneliness and isolation. And when people right. are feeling lonely, um, there are corporations that will monetize loneliness. Yes, yes. Well, I, I have mixed feelings about this discussion, uh, this recent discussion. And it, the mixed feelings are based on the fact that, well, this has been going on since the beginning of time, virtually. And the real question is, is it uh, much worse now? And if so, how and why? Um, and uh, I'm persuaded that there is a difference uh, with the, in the internet age, but um, you know, I think some of the more uh, some of the more extreme uh, prognostications and Jeremiads are not uh, are just not merited. I mean, this is this has always been true, right? Yeah. I mean, these people are still carrying clipboards, right? They were carrying carrying clipboards 40 years ago. I can attest to that on the streets of New York. So. Um, yeah, in, in that sense, um, you know, it's our battle now just as it's always been. Um, Facebook changes nothing. I mean, utility friends, Aristotle knew about it and he didn't have Facebook, so. There are some people from Facebook here tonight, so thank you. Not, I'm not just using you. Yeah, I mean, I Facebook, I think the social networks do change. There is a difference between, or important differences between the way that social networks kind of monetize or um, use friendship in instrumental ways and the way it's always been done. I mean, for one thing, there's, there's at least one other, perhaps many other parties there, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah, not just that's, that's you and the person difference. or you yeah. and the company. It's and I think there's another difference too, which is that um, I, I'm, I was just uh, reading an essay by Walter Benjamin about Proust where he says, he talks about one of the points of Proust being that uh, it's only by chance that you might find out uh, who you actually are or who, who, what your true image is. And that seems uh, increasingly less and less the case. 
In other words, uh, it used to be that you found the person you were to marry or you were found by that person, you know, perhaps through chance, but now you find that person through research. And uh, so that, that strikes me as a, as a really ethical change. We're going to move to the other side of the room only for time's sake. It's fascinating. Thank yes. you. Uh, that was great. Can you hear me? Speak right into it. Right into it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's great getting four different perspectives. Put it in your hand. Put it in your mouth. Like this. Okay. I'm kissing the mic. Okay. Uh, let me preface, I am part of the problem. I work as a web developer. Um, I have problems with it, but that's what I do. Um, one thing um, I wanted to ask Matt, Matt was, I see the line between uh, these categories like public versus private versus nonprofit kind of blurring. I mean, and that's very disorienting. If you were to look at the email you got from New York University, any charity, any business, they're all going to like the same tools. They're gonna love tracking you. They're gonna love everything about that. How does that influence your policy um, for the economy when before we just said, oh, if you're for profit, we have certain rules, and if you're not for profit, we have different rules? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that this imperative of sort of messaging for any kind of institution, nonprofit or, or whatever is, um, is so uh, strong that you have to get your message out. And it sometimes seems like a, it's just a kind of unthought fetish of, of maximizing one exposure of one's message. Um, well, I guess I sort of hinted at regulation in the in my little spiel. Um, in the the you know the French are much more uh, prone to regulate things. They have a very keen sense of how the fabric of everyday life can be degraded, and, and we make fun of them for their regulatory zeal in in America. Um, but that's not the only approach. So there's a um, I'm actually I'm afraid I'm not getting to the core of your point, but, but I want to mention that t um, Grand Central Terminal here, which is an entity that's, what is it? It's kind of quasi-public, it is public, and yet, pro I mean, it's, um, it used to be called the Indoor Times Square, apparently, and that was not meant as a compliment. It was just, it was horrible. But in the 90s, I'm told, there was a concerted effort to clean it up, um, and it's now I think a quite a grand space. It's it's fairly unusual uh, for a public you know transportation hub to be s as serene as it is. Um, and so what they did was they replaced all the advertising with retail, which might sound like what's the difference? Well, there's a, quite a big difference. The retail is quite muted and and fairly unobtrusive. And it turns out they're actually getting more revenue from the retail than from the screaming ads. And it's, you know, the, the ads are, are for something elsewhere. Whereas the retail, you know, you announce your own shop to those present in the space, and that, but that's a very different kind of um, advertising. So by way of contrast, I was in the 30th Street train station in Philadelphia um, several months ago. And it's a beautiful old train station. It could have had the same kind of feel as Grand Central, but um, the walls were nearly covered with these swimming pool-sized um, banners, uh, all advertising a single enterprise. And it turns out this is a thing. It's called a station domination campaign. <laughs> and on this occasion, it was for a uh, resort in the Bahamas um, so I felt like I was in a place that was, was no longer really a place. It was a mere surface for the display of enticements to be somewhere else. Um, and so it really did feel like a public patrimony had simply been sold off. And it made me feel that Philadelphia doesn't have any pride. Um, I, think and I, there, I don't know which uh, Supreme Court justice was, but one of them not all that long ago, said the people have a right to be let alone. Yeah. Where is he now? 
Right, I, but I think this is this that the feeling you get in such a, a um, place is connected to our wider sense that politics has been captured by uh, by narrow interests. In other words, that the very idea of a public has been eroded. Um, so. Yeah. Hello. It's the last. Hi. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Second to last. Um, I have a question about entertainment. And so you have periods occasionally like Hurricane Sandy that happened and we lose power and you suddenly find that you have all this time that was once devoted to <laughs> streaming or something and now you find that you have nothing else to do, you're forced to talk to the people you're stuck with and it, 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 the, the hurricane doesn't change the difficulties of a standard interaction, it, you still have moments of boredom but there's now nothing to compare it to, and so there's sort of a willingness to kind of like push through the boredom. And at the end, I, personally, I find that something meaningful is gained from it. And I wonder, I guess my question is, if you think that we're capable of auto-regulating our entertainment use, sort of like you come home from a hard day at work and you have Netflix accessible to you and you only have two hours of conscious time, if, if it's becoming harder and harder to sort of like make make these kinds of choices to, to sort of push through the unpleasant, push through tedium, push through resistance, pay attention to the people that you're with. I, I think this is happening more and more. That was very eloquent. I think people are doing this now. You know, they have their electronic Sabbaths and so on. This has been widely written about. I think it's a great question. And I think that in order to make that part of day-to-day -day life, people have to believe in certain kinds of values. Yeah. They have to believe in uh, the value that interests me in my new work on ideals, which is compassion. Or I think the value that interests Matt, tell me if I'm getting it wrong, which is community, uh, if I understand you correctly. And so you'd have to say to yourself, this is something I really want to pursue. This is something I want to promote. This feels good, makes me feel good, makes the people around me feel good. And I'm going to go pursue it, because although it's more difficult than distraction, um, it, in the long run, is good for everybody concerned. And what that, what requ what's required to make that happen is a larger public discourse about why things like community and compassion matter and make life resonate more strongly than entertainment does. The entertainment discourse is everywhere, right? But the compassion community discourse, it's a little harder to find, and it can seem a little bit stodgy and, and uptight, but I think there are dimensions of it as yet to be unfolded that can really lure people into this way of living that is richer, as you suggest, eloquently. I want to add a wrinkle to that, which was nice. Um, I think you're right that it's um, um, the, the positive attractions of some other thing, such as friendship, is the key here. In other words, to merely um, try to self-regulate and, yeah. you know, that's self-regulation is like a muscle, and it's one that's easily exhausted. So um, I think it's the pleasures of some alternative that um, that ultimately has to ground, um, you know, doing something other than merely passively consuming manufactured experiences that are offered to us, and that are you know, TV has gotten so good. Uh, so, there, you know, that's it's tough. Um, so, but I think Mark is right that you have to have some affirmative picture of something affir affirmable um, that is important to you. So. The good news is that um, I mean, there's a lot of research now that shows that if you make the effort to uh, do something uh, that's novel, so there's a initially there's a bit of a uh, of a uh, resistance to that because you're tired and you come home and it's very easy just to slip into this passive stream. But if you actually make the effort to do a new activity, like like practice the piano, it's the last thing you want to do when you walk home, walk in after uh, work. Uh, but if you actually sit down and start playing the piano and you were tested an hour later, you'll be happier and you'll be in a better place than if you had watched Netflix. So it's a matter of, of um, as others have said, 
a matter of making a commitment to having a better quality of experience, and only you can do that for yourself. But whenever you are actively engaged in your experience rather than passively engaged in your, your experience, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're generally better off. So we've just uh, um, witnessed a very rare moment in an academic panel where it ends on a feel-good note <laughs> and with action items, no less. So practice the piano tonight. We'll be milling around a little bit afterward. Thank you very, very much for your attention.